Hi, everybody. I'm Dave. I'm the pastor at Grace Baptist Church in Ottawa, Illinois. I want to welcome you to our weekly services. In addition to watching and listening to this week's message, I would ask you to go to our YouTube channel, click on the Playlist tab, and there you'll find each week we put together a set of praise and worship songs that go with our weekly message. If you click on the Channels tab, you'll find links to various other YouTube channels where your kids can participate in age-specific children and young adult church services. And I would also encourage you to go to our website. It's findinghisgrace.org. That's findinghisgrace, one word, findinghisgrace.org. And check out all of the things that we have posted there that you and your family can participate in. Last week was Easter Sunday, and even though we're, most of us are sheltering at home because of the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm hoping that each of you had a great Easter Sunday. We were able to have a great Easter Sunday because even though we can't get together in our church building like we normally do, we can still celebrate, and we did celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ is alive today. Easter is the day that we celebrate the greatest event that happened in all of human history, which was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And on Easter Sunday, I started a brand new series titled The Miracle of Mercy. And today, um, I'm continuing on with that series with week two. My message today is titled, God Can Use Anybody. We're going to look at the life of the Apostle Paul. Because if there's anybody who had a checkered past and then God turned around and used that person in a very mighty way, it was the Apostle Paul. We're going to look at a passage of scripture in the second letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and he tells in that uh, piece of scripture how he was used by God, and we can take those secrets, those principles, and apply them to our lives, and we also can be used by God in a mighty way, because God has a plan for each of our lives. Before we were ever born, God had a plan for each of us to be used by Him to accomplish His purposes. And so today we're going to talk about how we can be used by God, and we're going to look at those five principles. Today's message is for Sunday, April the 19th, and the message is titled, God Can Use Anybody. Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you today to Grace Baptist Church. For those of you who are listening and watching online, uh, or for those of you who are just listening through our website, the audio recordings or the CDs that we send, I want to welcome all of you to this series that we started last week called Miracle of Mercy. We're in the second week of that series this week. So I want to start out by talking about the greatest joy that any of us can experience in life. And there's nothing else that compares to the thrill of this. And that's the thrill of being used by God for a purpose greater than yourself. There's nothing else that we could do that could ever come close to that. And when you have that feeling, when you know that you're in the moment and you're being used by God for a purpose greater than yourself, that's when you finally say, this is it. This is why I'm alive. I finally get it now. I understand this is my place in life and this is my identity and this is why I'm here. I know now why I was made and what my purpose in life is. Because all of us were made for something for more than just living for ourselves. Because if we just live for ourselves, we're going to end up living a very frustrated and a very unfulfilled and eventually a very bored life because we're not been a big enough cause for any of us to live for. We all need something bigger than ourselves that, that pulls us out of ourselves and that makes us bigger than ourselves. And, and greater than ourselves, something where we go, this is exactly what I was made for, and you know it. So today, as I continue in this Miracle of Mercy series, I want us to look at the idea that God can use anybody, which is the title of my message this week. And He truly can use anybody because of His mercy. I want to start in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 13. And the Bible tells us in this passage of Scripture, it says, Give yourselves completely to God, every part of you, because you've been brought from death to life, and now you want to be used by God for good and for His righteous purposes. But the problem is this. The problem is there's a lot of people who secretly fear that God could never, ever possibly use them. 
oh yeah, God can use that person over there, God can use her, or God can use that guy, God can bless that person, but God's never going to do that with me. And so we feel like, so many of us, that God is never going to use us. And the reason that we feel that way in a lot of cases is because we feel either disqualified or we feel unqualified. So we feel disqualified a lot of times because we know our past. We know the things that we've done. We know the mistakes that we've made and, and the sins that we've committed. We know all the stuff that didn't work right in our lives. And so we tell ourselves because of our past that there's no way that God is ever going to use me. God can use a lot of other people, but I'm disqualified because of some poor and maybe even some really stupid decisions that I've made in my past. Other people don't feel disqualified, but they feel unqualified because they look at themselves and they say, well, I don't have the talents. I don't have this person's talents, or I don't have that guy's gifts, and, and I don't have the ability or the education or the background. I don't have whatever it is that you use as an excuse. I just don't have the opportunities that everybody else has. And so people walk around in life and they think I'm either disqualified or I'm unqualified to be used by God. But neither of those feelings are true. They're just lies is what they are. God wants to use all of us in ways that we haven't even imagined. And we only have to look at the life of the Apostle Paul to blow up both of those myths. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture that comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And in this passage of Scripture, the first several verses, what Paul does is he gives us five secrets or five principles for us being used by God. So for all of you listening today, if you want God's power in your life, if you want to know that your life stands for something, that your life matters, that you're fulfilling the purpose that you were created for, and you want your life to count, and you don't just want to be a spot on this planet and then you die and that's it, then you need to understand these five things, these five secrets that Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So let's get right in to these five things. We're going to go through the beginning part of this chapter, basically verse by verse. So the first principle, the first secret that's found in verse 1 of chapter 4 is this. Number one, we need to never forget that it's all because of God's mercy. Now, last week I gave you a definition of mercy. What I said was that mercy was undeserved forgiveness, forgiveness that we don't deserve, and it's also unearned kindness. So when somebody forgives you and you don't deserve it, that's mercy. And when somebody shows you a kindness and you can't pay them back, that's mercy. And so God treats us with mercy every single second of our lives, all throughout our life. And so the first thing that we need to remember is that everything that God does in us, He does by mercy. And everything that God does for you, He does by mercy. And everything that God does with you and by you, He does by mercy. And everything that God does through you to make a contribution to this world, he does by mercy. It's a very important principle that we need to understand that it's all, everything, is because of God's mercy. We haven't earned it. We haven't deserved it. It's just His mercy that He showers on us every single day. So let's look at the passage of Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. And Paul says this. He says, God in His mercy has given us this ministry and work to do. That's why we do not have to become discouraged and we never give up. Now, don't get all freaked out or wigged out by the word ministry in this passage of Scripture. Some of you listening today probably think, well, that's a churchy word. Ministers is what pastors do. And that's not true at all. Ministry is just something, anytime you use your talents, that God has given you to help somebody else out, you're doing ministry. It's not something that you do just in church. It can be done in church. But it's also something that you do out in the world. Everybody has a ministry, and every person is a minister, according to Scripture. So if you're an accountant, let's say, and you're good at accounting, and you help people with accounting, 
Accounting is your ministry. You could be a truck driver, and truck driving could be your ministry. You could be a salesman, and you're selling products that actually help people. Well, that's a ministry. You could be an attorney and have a ministry. You could be a school teacher or a child care worker, first responders, all the people that we're talking about today during this pandemic that are putting their lives on the line every day, hospital workers and grocery store workers. Those are ministries. Anything that you do, when you use the talents and the gifts and the abilities that God has given you to help other people, that's your ministry. And he says, Paul says in this passage of scripture, that God in his mercy has given us this ministry or this work to do. Now, there's a couple of benefits about really understanding um, this principle. And the first is, when we understand mercy, we don't have to prove our worth any longer. And that relieves so many of us who are workaholics. Because if you overwork, if you work too much and your life is just work, work, work all the time, you're trying to prove your worth to other people through your work. But your worth has nothing at all to do with your work. It's the fact that you are a child of God. It's the fact that God made you and He loves you and He sent Jesus to die for you, just like we talked about over this past weekend. That shows your worth, not the work that you do every single day. The other thing that happens when you understand mercy is you don't have to wallow in the mistakes that you make. Because we all make mistakes, and some of us have made some really horrible mistakes in the past. We all sin. The Bible says that we're all sinners, that we all fall short of the glory of God. And so we all have blown it, and we continue to blow it every single day. We all made dumb, dumb decisions in the past, and we're probably going to make some really dumb decisions in the future. But we don't have to wallow in that because we don't need to be stuck in the past since God is showing me mercy. And we never forget that God is showing us mercy even when we start to remember the things that we've done in the past. Paul, who wrote this passage of Scripture that we're looking at, he's a man that had a horrible past. And he's, he's brutally honest about it when you read the letters that he wrote uh, to the different churches of his time. Because Paul, before he became a preacher and a church planner, he was a persecutor of Christians. And he even participated in the murder of Christians. And so Paul was exactly the opposite of what you'd expect being somebody that God, that God could use. He's not the type of person that you would think that's the guy that God wants to use. Paul wrote a letter to a guy named Timothy, who was a young pastor in Ephesus, and he said this in his letter. This is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. He says, I thank Christ Jesus because he trusted me and he gave me this work of serving him. So he's telling Timothy that in the past he spoke against Christ. He even persecuted Christ. And, and he says, you know, in fact, I did all kinds of things to hurt him. But God turned around and showed me mercy. And so your past does not preclude your future. Your past is past, and it's over. Look at what else Paul has to say in Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 and 15. He says, you know what I was like before I followed Christ. You know what I was like, how I violently persecuted Christians. I did my best to get rid of them. But then something happened. For it pleased God in His kindness. Remember mercy undeserved or unearned kindness. It pleased God in His kindness to choose me and to call me even before I was born. And then look what he says. What undeserved mercy. So Paul is saying, you know, when God made him, even before he made him, God decided what he wanted Paul to do with his life. He knew how he was going to use Paul. He even already knew all of the stupid, horrible things that Paul would do. He already knew in advance all the sins that we all were going to commit. Yet Paul says, he still chose me and he still called me. That, folks, is simply mercy. And the same is true with all of you today. God has a calling on all of our lives. We just need to 
respond to it. God says, I'm going to use you in spite of the fact that you're broken. God has never, ever, ever in all of history used a perfect person except his son Jesus because there never has been a perfect person except Jesus Christ. God has only ever used flawed people. He only uses broken and marred people, people who are weak and sinful people because that's everybody. People who don't have it all together. Everything that gets done that's ever been good in this world is done by less than perfect people. And that's because of the mercy of God. If you go through the Bible and you start making a list of all of these famous people in Scripture that God has used in spite of what you might consider to be a weakness, I'm telling you, you would come up with a very, very long list and an impressive list. So let me give you a couple of examples. Abraham. Abraham was old. He was, he was 90 years old when God started using him, and nothing really kicked in for Abraham until he was 100 years old. And some of you think, man, I, I wasted a lot of time. Well, you didn't waste as much time as Abraham did, but he's a great example of how, how God can use somebody who wasted time in their past. Jacob was a chronic liar, and God used him. And Jacob even ran away from difficult situations in his life. Joseph was abused. Gideon was poor. He was the poorest kid in his family. Samson had all kinds of problems, if you know the story of Samson, but he was, a, he was basically a reckless codependent is what he was, yet God used him as one of the judges of Israel. Rahab was a prostitute, and yet Rahab shows up in God's Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11 as a great woman of faith. He used her in spite of her mistakes. Jonah was fearful and reluctant. Remember, he ran away when God called him to go preach to the Ninevites. So he was fearful. He, he didn't want to do it. Elijah was suicidal. Naomi, used by God, was an elderly widow. Jeremiah had chronic depression. And God used him. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because he cried all the time. He wrote a book in the Bible called Lamentations. Lament is to weep and to feel sorrow for. I mean, that was Jeremiah. Uh, David, very, very famous person in Scripture. David had an affair. And then he had his mistress's husband killed. So, I mean, I would think that would disqualify him. But David became known as a man after God's heart. He wrote the book of Psalms. And, and God used him in a great way. John the Baptist in the New Testament was eccentric, to say the least. Peter, we talked about him a few weeks ago. He was impulsive. He had some very serious anger management problems. So, you got a problem with your temper today? It doesn't matter. God wants to use you. Martha worried a lot. How many of us are worrying wards and we worry all the time about the things that's going on? Well, if that's you, God wants to use you. That Samaritan woman had, had, had several failed marriages. God used her. Zacchaeus had been an unethical scam artist. God used him. God used Thomas, who had doubts. And Timothy was timid. And Moses and David and Paul were all guilty of murder in their past. So let me ask you this morning, after hearing that list of all of these people that God has used and the horrible things that they've done or the, the, the shortcomings that they've had, what's your excuse this morning? Why, why is it that you think that you cannot be used by God? So here's something that I want you to remember this morning, and that's this. Every saint, every saint has a past, and every sinner has a future. Let me say that again. Every saint has a past, and every sinner has a future. This is everybody. So everybody that you think, that guy, you think he's a good guy, that man that you think is a godly man, that woman that you look at her and you think she's a saint, every single one of them has a past. And I guarantee you, they've all messed up, they're all flawed, they've fumbled the ball, they've screwed up, and it's all happened in their past. So every saint has a past. And every sinner has a future. And that's because of the mercy of God. It doesn't matter how bad you've messed up. God says, I want to use you for good. And I want you to feel me using you in your life. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. 
It says this, it says, It is God Himself who has made us what we are and given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, He planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. That's all of our work to do. That's our ministry. When you, when you finally get to the point in your life where you say, I'm going to use the talent, and the ability and the background and, and all of these things that God has given me in His mercy, I've got to help somebody with that. When you realize that, that's what God has planned for you to do. When you look at what you're good at, that's what you're supposed to do in life. And when you come to that realization, God can start using you in very special ways. So that's the starting point, is we need to never, ever forget that it's all because of God's mercy. Okay, here's the second key to being used by God. Key number two is we all need to be real. We have, we have to be real. We have to be authentic. We have to be genuine. And we all just need to be ourselves because we can't be somebody that we're not. God did not create any of us to be somebody else. All of us start off as originals. And unfortunately, most of us end up as carbon copies of other people because we start trying to be like other people. When you get to heaven, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you become part of His family. When you get to heaven, one day God is not going to say to you, Hey, hey Dave, how come you weren't more like Moses? Or, or why weren't you more like your sister or, or your mom or your brother or your dad? God is not going to compare us to anybody else. And this is a problem today because there's so many people who are trying to be somebody that they're not. And they're, and they're trying to be somebody that they're not because they think somebody else wants them to be that way. And so they're living for the approval of other people. Or sometimes people actually think that God wants them to be that way. And they think, you know, God would really love me more or approve of me more or use me more if I'd act like this person. But that's not true. God's, God's love and the way God uses you is not based on how you act. That's mercy. He loves you no matter what you do, good or bad in your life. So if you try to be somebody that you're not, there's some immediate problems that crop up in your life. Three things that are going to happen in your life. First, you're always going to be under stress because you're constantly trying to be somebody that you're not. Secondly, you're always going to have this fear of being exposed. You know, what if people find out what I'm really like? I, I can't afford for people to find out what I'm really like. And then thirdly, you're going to end up manipulating people because you're afraid of who God really made you to be. So let's look at what Paul has to say back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 in verse 2. He says this, he says, we don't try to trick anyone, and we don't twist the word of God. Instead, we teach the truth plainly, showing everyone who we really are. Then they can know in their hearts what kind of people we are in God's sight. In other words, he's telling us that we've got to be real. Paul's saying, I've got nothing to hide. I'm completely transparent. What you see is what you get. Now people, when you look at people and the way they live their lives and the way people grow and mature, people don't actually grow from their strengths. We grow from our weaknesses. If you go out and you only try to show your strengths to the world and you go, hey, look at me, you know, here's all my strengths. You know what people are going to say? They're going to say, goody for you, and then they're going to ignore you. But on the other hand, when you get up and you go and you talk to people about here's where I blew it, Here's where I made a mistake. This is my weakness. Here's the real deal. I'm being as genuine and honest with you as I can. That actually causes people to draw closer to you. And it makes intimacy much better in a relationship when you reveal your weaknesses, not your strengths. I mean, there are so many people, and this is sad, but there's so many people in marriages today that are terrible marriages, or at least marriages not anywhere close to what God wants them to be, because people are trying to hide their weaknesses, even from their spouses. And that just does not work, and it makes that relationship not work the way God wants it to work. 
Many of us, unfortunately, many of us live behind these walls and we fake it. And we wear these masks and we live these lives of insecurity. And I'm telling you, the antidote to your insecurity and all those secret fears and all of those things that you don't want to show people who you really are, the antidote is to get God's spirit of mercy in you. And the way that you do that is by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 15, Paul says it like this. He says, the spirit we receive, that's, that's the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of mercy. He says, the spirit of, of mercy, the spirit we receive, does not make us slaves again to fear. It makes us children of God. So that verse is telling us that there's two ways we can live our lives. We can live either under the bondage of a spirit of fear, or we can live freely as a child of God under the mercy of God. And you all get to make that decision. When you finally start to realize and understand and grasp the fact that you're a child of God, then you realize that it's all because of His mercy. You don't have to fake it anymore. And you can be real with everybody around you. That's secret number two. Here's the third key. The third secret of being used by God the rest of your life, number three, is we need to remember that it's not about us. It's not about me. And it's not about you. And every time we forget that, we're going to either get bitter from problems that we have in our lives, or we're going to get prideful from the blessings that we're experiencing in our life. When you forget that it's not about you, you start to take everything personally. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Paul gives us this third key. Here's what he says. He said, our message is not about ourselves. It is about Jesus Christ as the Lord. We are merely your servants for Jesus' sake. And he actually uses that phrase for Jesus' sake twice in this chapter. So he's telling us it's not about us. It's all about Jesus. And that is a huge um, change in our point of view when we realize that everything that we do is all about Jesus. That's the most countercultural statement you could possibly make in today's society, that it's not about you. It's, it's like the exact opposite of everything that you've ever been taught and everything that you hear all the time because everything in our society today says that it is all about you. Every advertisement appeals to your self-centeredness and it appeals to your narcissism and every single message you get every day says it's all about you like we do it all for you have, have it your way you deserve a break today today you get the best you're number one it's all about you and on and on and on a thousand times a day in our society it says it's all about you and it's very hard to live an unselfish life in today's culture because our entire culture, our entire society, even our entire economy is built on the fact that everybody says it's all about you. But I hate to tell you this, folks, but it's not. It's not about you. You are absolutely not the center of the universe. God is the center of of the universe. And when you live a self-centered life, you start to become frustrated and you become unfulfilled and eventually you become bored with your life. When you really start to understand and you start to live your life with this realization that it's not about you and it's about God, it changes everything. And when you do, just to let you know, you're going to find that you're going to be tested on that sentence every day for the rest of your life. Sometimes 30, 40, 50 times a day, you're going to have to say this to yourself. It's not about me. It's not about me. When you get a great opportunity to do something, you have to say, it's not about me. When you get a, a problem, have a big problem that comes along in your life, and you're facing this big problem, it's not about me. When you're criticized, whether it's fairly or unfairly, you just have to tell yourself, it's not about me. And when you're praised and somebody says something nice about you, 
It's not about me. And when somebody gets angry, it's not about me. When somebody's upset because their needs aren't being met, it's not about me. I see this happening all the time in people who become believers, people who are followers of Christ. And when they first become Christians, they, they want to get involved in some type of ministry. And I notice that when they first start serving as a brand new believer, they're doing it with all the right motivations. They do it, they do it out of gratitude to God. Nobody's telling them to do that. They're not fearful and they're not pressured. It's just they, they want to give back. And so they look at it and they say, God has saved me. God has given me the greatest gift I could ever receive. I want to do something with my life. I want my life to count. Just in gratitude, I want to serve God. But I also see, unfortunately, slowly, sometimes, people who are doing a particular work or service or ministry, all of a sudden, the motivation starts to change. And then we see them start to do it for the wrong reasons. Like, I like the approval I'm getting. Maybe it is all about me. I like the applause that I'm getting. Maybe it is about me. It makes me feel important. And all of a sudden, they start doing it for themselves. So listen, folks. Paul is crystal clear on this. He's absolutely clear. Twice in this passage, he says, Paul, he says, I do what I do for Jesus. I do it for Jesus' sake, not for me. And he says, we're just servants for Jesus' sake. When you get to the point in your life, just like Paul, where you start living day by day by day, shining the focus away from you, and shining the focus on God, when you do that, that's when God can really start to use you in a very major way in your life. When you realize that it's not about you ever. Never has been and never will be. That's point number three. Here's number four. This is a really big one, point number four. If you get this, God will use you in ways that you cannot even possibly imagine. And Paul, Paul talks about this in the next passage. So number four, we need to use our pain to help others. Use our pain to help others. We need to start using the things that we're ashamed of, using the things that have hurt us the most, using the things that have been problems in our life in order to help other people who are going through those same exact things. Paul, as our example, went through some enormous pain in his life, which was why Paul could be used by God in enormous ways. So later on in this same letter, in this same book of Scripture, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28, Paul says this. He's giving his testimony about pain. He says, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I have received 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent night and day in the open sea. I've been in danger from rivers. I've been in danger from bandits, from my own countrymen, from Gentiles. I've been in danger in the city, in the country, at sea. I've been in danger from false brothers. I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and I've known thirst. And I've often gone without food. I've been cold. I've been naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. You see, Paul was used in an enormous way because he had enormous pain. And he used it for good, and he used it for God. I guarantee you, folks, if I were to bring Paul up here with me this morning, and I know I can't, but if I were able to bring him up here this morning and say, Paul, why did you put up with all that? Why did you go through all the pain and suffering, and why did you never give up? He'd say the same exact thing. He'd, he'd tell you, I'm using my pain to help others. I want to bring people to Jesus Christ. Let's look at his written response in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. He says, we often suffer, but we're never crushed. Even when we don't know what to do, we never give up. In times of trouble, God is with us, and when we're knocked down, 
we get up again. So, listen, I mean, we are going to go through pain in our lives. Some of us today are going through some pain. We're experiencing pain because of the pandemic that we're going through. Some of us are experiencing economic pain. Some of us are experiencing physical pain. Some of you are still grieving the loss of a loved one who was very close to you, and you're going through pain today. And if anybody tells you differently that you're not going to have to go through pain in your life, they're just downright lying to you is what they're doing. So because we're experiencing pain, and I'm not minimizing anybody's pain this morning, but because you're experiencing pain, we may as well use it for good. Don't waste the pain that we're feeling. We need to use it to help others, just like Paul did. The next verse, 2 Corinthians 4.15, he says this, he says, All of these sufferings of ours are for your benefit. That, folks, is called redemptive suffering. Redemptive suffering is basically suffering for the benefit of other people. It's where when you go through pain and suffering, you choose to use those experiences in your life to help other people in order to bless other people. When Jesus Christ himself was hanging on the cross, he was doing redemptive suffering. He was redeeming the world. He was paying the redemption, the price for your sins and my sins. He wasn't dying for his sins. He was dying for our sins. That's redemptive suffering. Suffering for the benefit of others. And then look what Paul goes on to say. He says, And the more of you who are one to Christ, the more there are to thank Him for His great mercy. And the more God gets the glory. Paul says, I keep going because I know it's helping others and I know it's bringing people to Christ. So why do we do what we do here at Grace? We do it for Jesus' sake. And we do it because there are people who need to know the Lord. We do it for the benefit of others. We're not doing this for our benefit. We're doing it for others, just like Paul did and just like God wants us to do. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, this is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day, for our present troubles are quite small. Can you imagine Paul saying that with everything that he's been through? But he says, our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. Forever, for all of eternity. Paul's telling us that even though our bodies are dying, and they are, we're wasting away every second of every day, he says our spirits are being renewed every day. Renewed every single day by the mercy of God. So we use our pain to help others. And it's a very important point. We use our pain to help others. Here's the fifth and final secret of being used by God. Paul's last secret. We need to stay focused on eternity. Stay focused on eternity. We've got to maintain this eternal perspective. That way we don't get overwhelmed by our current problems. So the bigger our picture of God is and the things that He has planned for us for eternity, the smaller our problems seem. And the more that we understand what's going to happen in eternity, the less we're bothered by the bad things that happen here on earth. If you have this big picture of God, you have a small picture of your problems. And if you lose your eternal perspective, if you forget that it's not about now, not only is it not about you, but it's also not about now, then your problems have the potential to overwhelm you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 says, These little troubles, again, Paul, these little troubles are getting us ready for an eternal glory that will make all of our troubles seem like nothing. That, folks, is an eternal perspective. When we start to understand how short this life is, even if you live to be 100 years old, which most of us don't, but when we realize how short this life is and how long eternity 
eternity is, this life and all the things that go with it is really small potatoes. And again, I'm not minimizing anything that you're going through right now, but really we can put up with all kinds of stuff on this planet if we know, if we realize what's going to happen in eternity. And you know the rewards and the blessing and the joy of being used by God. So these little troubles, as Paul calls them, are getting us ready for an eternal glory that will make all of our present troubles seem like nothing. Then in verse 18, he says, so we don't look at the troubles we can see right now. Rather, we look forward to what we have not yet seen. For the troubles we see will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. That's a very long time forever. You know, when we look at this life, there's only three motivations in life. We're either going to live our, we're going to live our life on one of these three. The first is we can live our life and be motivated by internal motivations. And there's a lot of people that live their lives based on internal motivation. You know, I want to be happy, or I want to be popular, or I want to be rich, or loved, or I want to be famous, whatever it is. And so you've got your internal motivation that motivates you through life. Or you can be motivated not by internal motivation, but by external motivation. Like, I'm afraid of being fired, or I want to get that promotion. It, it's external. It's like the carrot and the stick principle. And it's, it's the reward or the penalty of other people around you. And so you're motivated by what other people think and do. And that's external. But the highest motivation in life is not internal motivation. And it's not external motivation. It's eternal motivation. It's being motivated by the fact that this life that we're living right now, this life is a test. It's, it's like the dress rehearsal. It's the get ready stage for the real show. Which, when we become followers of Christ, the real show is going to go on in heaven. And it's going to go on for trillions and trillions and trillions of years. So let me close today with just two questions. First question, what is the prison that's been holding you back from being used by God in your life? What prison have you been locked up in? What is it that's in your past? that has prevented you from being used by God in the present. And you're locked up today by fear, or you're locked up by anger, or you're imprisoned by regret or resentment, or maybe you've been hurt in the past, or you've had a major failure, or you've had a shame, or you've had an excuse, or maybe you're experiencing something very painful today in your life. What is it that's keeping you and what's holding you back from finally saying, God, I, I'm all in. I'm, I'm totally surrendered. I, I've only been partially in. But I'm going to be all in now for you because of your mercy. The second question that I want to ask you this morning is, do you really want to live the rest of your life just for yourself? Because you're not a big enough reason to live for. I hate to tell you that. But you're not. That's not a big enough reason to get out of, out of your beds in the morning. Do you, do you want to live the rest of your life just for yourself? Or do you want to live the rest of your life to be used by God for the purpose that you were created to live for? We here at Grace, we're in the middle of this eight-week journey called the Miracle of Mercy. And you can either join us for the next six weeks or you can get left behind. But let me tell you, your future, all of you listening today and watching today, your future is going to be determined by certain hinge points in your life, certain decisive moments. There's moments in your life where you're going to make the decision to go this way or that way. And they happen several times in your life. This may be one of those moments in your life this morning. Whether you're going to decide that I'm going to go this way, and I'm going to live my life for myself, or I'm going to go that way, and I'm going to be all in, or I'm just going to continue to be a casual Christian, or maybe even an outsider, not even part of God's family yet, or I'm really going to decide to totally surrender myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You can say, I don't really care about God's purposes in my life. I'm going to live for me or I'm going to live for Him totally and completely. This is one of those decisive moments in all of our lives. So which way will you choose this morning? Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for um, the things that you shared with us this morning, the things that you showed us. I, I thank you for the secrets that you inspired Paul to write when um, he wrote this letter to the church at Corinth and, and the ways that you showed us that we can really be all in for you, Lord. I pray that all of us listening and watching today would make the decision that we want to experience your mercy in a very special way. We want to be used by you in a very special way. It all starts by a decision that says, I want to accept the free gift of salvation. I want to become part of your family. And I pray, Lord, for those that are listening today that have not made that decision, that they would decide today that they want you, Lord, to shower your mercy on them and to forgive them of the sins they've committed and allow them to be part of your family. And then, Lord, once those decisions are made, we still, every single day of our lives, are faced with decisions about how we live our lives and whether we live our lives for ourselves or we live our lives for you. And I pray today that there's many, many people that would make the decision that they're going to live their life for you in every way possible, that everything in their life they're turning over to you, Lord, right now as we speak. Lord, we thank you for um, your mercy. We thank you for the protection that you've shown us. And we just pray, Lord, that you will continue to love us as we know that you will. And we thank you for the opportunities that you give us every single day. In Jesus' name, amen.